I, I start from the supposition that the world is topsy-turvy, that things are all wrong, that the wrong people are in jail and the wrong people are out of jail, that the wrong people are in power and the wrong people are out of power, that the wealth is distributed in this country and the world in such a way as not simply to require small reform, but to require a drastic reallocation of wealth. I start from the supposition that we don't have to say too much about this because all we have to do is think about the state of the world today and realize that things are all upside down. Now, if you don't think, if you just listen to TV and read scholarly things, you actually begin to think that things are not so bad or that just little things are wrong. But you have to get a little detached and then come back and look at the world, and you are horrified. So we have to start from that supposition that things are really topsy-turvy. And our topic is topsy-turvy, civil disobedience. Now, as soon as you say the topic is civil disobedience, you're saying our problem is civil disobedience. That is not our problem. Our problem is civil obedience. Our problem is the numbers of people all over the world who have obeyed the dictates of the leaders of their government and have gone to war. And millions have been killed because of this obedience. We recognize this for Nazi Germany. We know that the problem there was obedience, that the people obeyed Hitler. People obeyed. That was wrong. They should have challenged and they should have resisted. And if we were only there, we would have showed them. Even in Stalin's Russia, we can understand that. People are obedient. All these herd-like people. Remember those bad old days when people were exploited by feudalism? Everything was terrible in the Middle Ages. <laughs> but now we have Western civilization, the rule of law. The rule of law has regularized and maximized the injustice that existed before the rule of law. That is what the rule of law has done. When in all the nations of the world, the rule of law is the darling of the leaders and the plague of the people, we ought to begin to recognize this. We have to transcend these national boundaries in our thinking. Nixon and Brezhnev have much more in common with one another than we have with Nixon. J. Edgar Hoover has far more in common with the head of the Soviet secret police than he has with us. It's the international dedication to law and order that binds the leaders of all countries in a comradely bond. That's why we're always so surprised when they get together. They smile, they shake hands, they smoke cigars. They really like one another, no matter what they say. <laughs> what we are trying to do, I assume, is really to get back to the principles and aims and spirit of the Declaration of Independence. This spirit is resistance to illegitimate authority and to forces that deprive people of their life and liberty and right to pursue happiness. And therefore, under these conditions, it urges the right to alter or abolish their current form of government. And the stress had been on abolish. But to establish the principles of the Declaration of Independence, we're going to need to go outside the law, to stop obeying the laws that demand killing or that allocate wealth the way it's been done, or that put people in jail for petty technical offenses and keep other people out of jail for enormous crimes. My hope is that this kind of spirit will take place not just in this country, but in other countries, because they all need it. People in all countries need the spirit of disobedience to the state, which is, which is not a metaphysical thing, but a thing of force and wealth. And we need a kind of declaration of interdependence among people in all countries of the world who are striving for the same thing.